you're finishing a piece, you put the double bar on it, you're finally done, you decide to make it a PDF, you export it, you're all excited, you're gonna look at all the great work that you've done, and as soon as it's a PDF, you start to notice a thousand mistakes. Second clarinet part has no dynamics. Is this passage, is it pizzicato, is it arco? I don't even remember, I don't know. I don't know why I didn't put it in there. And you finish this piece, but it's not actually finished. Like the musical writing, those decisions have already been made, but the score is not ready to be shipped. It's not ready to be handed to someone. It's not shippable. When you're at the finish line, when the deadline is breathing down your neck, it can be really hard to finish the piece and then realize, oh God, I have all of this other work to do. I have all of these things that I need to clean up in the score. And it's really easy to forget all of the things that a good finished score needs to you know, be handed off, to be shippable, to be something that a professional conductor or musician can look at and say, okay, I have everything that I need. Thank you, I will make the music now. So I wanted to make a video about all of the things that will make your score look professional. What is it gonna make it shippable? What's gonna make it available to that person and give them everything that they need? I have to use a checklist because there's a lot of stuff and it's easy to forget. It's easy to get going and then be like, oh, you know, I never made the program notes or oh, I didn't, I forgot about adding measure numbers through the whole score. This is a video that's gonna highlight all the things that it has taken me forever to learn and remember to put into my scores. So I hope that it's helpful. Now I need to put out a disclaimer first. Everyone, and I mean everyone, has a very specific and particular way of doing things. And that is okay. There are going to be things that I say in the video that you might disagree with, that you might dislike, and, and that's okay. I'm just putting it out there because there are things that took me a long time to become aware of, to develop opin an opinion of. I'm just trying to be helpful that way. <laughs> I've been in composition orchestration classes where one teacher will say, you should always do this with your string parts. This is what you do and this is what you should always do. And then I literally go to the next class and they're like, you should never ever do that thing with your string parts. And the trick is, is that they're both right because conventions in different mediums mean different things. There are just different ways of doing things in scores for the particular context that you're working in. So it's just worth having that in the background of anything that you do. For instance, we see a lot of discrepancies in orchestra scores. On the face of it, orchestra scores sound like, oh, well, uh, they all should have the same formatting roughly, right? But actually the ones that we interact with can be very different depending on the particular context of what it is that you're doing. You know, most young composers who are starting out probably are familiar with scores like these. This is a study score. It's a Dover publication. It's got all four of the Brahms symphonies. And the purpose of this score isn't really to perform it. It's more to study it and learn the orchestration or the compositional choices that are being made or whatever. Dover publications are going to do things like put a ton of measures. They're going to just shove them into like a single system. Whereas in something like a conductor score, you would want it spaced out in a way that leaves you room to write in every measure. Conductor scores, generally speaking, are bigger and usually keep the same formatting. Like, you know, we're not doing that thing like we do in, in Dover scores where we, you know, we cut out all the measures of instruments that are not being used at that time to save space. It's essentially a way of saving money and saving ink. For a conductor score, it's really important that the layout remains the same. They're usually larger in their format. So a good example of this is kind of like Star Wars. It's kind of like a study score, but it really is essentially a conductor score. It's built in a way where it doesn't, where they could e have easily, you know, saved a ton of ink and saved a ton of pages, but that's not really the goal of it. The goal of it is for, it's it's a conductor score. What I'm gonna say, what I'm trying to do here is a very general video of just pointing out things that, hey, this is worth thinking about. I'm not gonna be really talking about how to do different notational things. I use Sibelius, that's what you're gonna see. But I mean, these things I'm sure are all applicable on Finale or Dorico or Muse Score or Note Flight or whatever particular notation software they use. At the end of the day, it's just worth being aware that these are options and things that you want to consider in your music. The actual size of the paper matters. The size of the paper for a score is different than the size of the paper for a part or just the regular paper that you use in general. For what I'm going to say here, this mostly applies to people in the U.S. or those countries that use similar systems. It might not be exactly uniform anywhere else. For the U.S., you're going to use tabloid size paper for your scores. It's essentially a regular sheet of paper is what's called letter. It's eight and a half by 11. Well, a tabloid is basically 
basically two of those next to each other. It's basically double the size of it. Tabloid is the way to go with large ensemble scores for orchestra if you're doing for a wind ensemble or something that has, you know, a, a large number of people that's going to essentially need a conductor, then you're going to do tabloid. For choral music, it's not always the same. You might have a lot of people, but not that many different parts. So sometimes letter is okay, but that kind of depends on the situation. Like if it's a choral piece and you have an orchestra, yeah, you, you're going to want to do tabloid. But for chamber and stuff like that, letter is usually fine. And the other important thing is that you always want to have them be portrait, which is the uh, is the long side up. Uh, I know that in jazz world, there are a lot of scores that are done on the landscape where we have to take the long edge and we flip it over. You can definitely do that in some chamber music things in, in the classical world. And you can especially do that when if you're writing like solo music, if it's like a piece for solo bass clarinet or whatever. But generally speaking for large ensembles, yeah, the conductors don't really do that. Especially like tabloid, landscape is is not not recommended the next thing is going to be a good title page this is something that is important in basically every arena it's important in large ensemble scores it's important in choral scores it's certainly important in chamber scores the only place that it's not really an issue at all is in film world you're not you don't they don't care about the title page they care about you showing up and having a good recording session so the you know as long as it's clear what the thing is you don't need to be going crazy making a cool design for your film because no one is going to experience that the title page seems kind of like a silly thing right well the audience doesn't experience that when you're in the concert hall, they're not going to see the title. No one sees the title page of whatever piece that they're going to listen to. But conductors and music directors do. And chamber music leaders do. And that's really important because you want it to stick out. You know, these people are going to be looking at scores on websites. Ideally, your website where it's all nice and presented and you have all the information available and it's got a really cool title and it caught their eye and so on and so forth. But a good title page is really important. It's the same sort of relationship with books. You can't know what a good book is really going to be like You have to, until you read it. And the only way you kind of choose to do it is either word of mouth, someone telling you, hey, this is good, or you look at the title page. You see, what's the title? What is it about? And you get a snapshot. You get like two seconds of looking at it before you say, okay, this is interesting. I want to check it out. Let me read the first page or read the back or whatever. I remember getting this book at my little book fair as a kid and literally... All I had seen of it was just the cover. I liked that the mouse had the sword, and so I bought it. And then I got really into the series, and hey, there you go. This is probably my best example of this, where I saw the title and I was like, wow, that's interesting. I don't know what that means. And I remember getting it and reading the first sentence of this thing, completely blown away by it. He became one of my favorite authors. And it literally, you know, I, I've bought many of his books, and it all came down to literally just seeing... Does it have an interesting title? It doesn't have an interesting premise. And sometimes that's all that you need. But it's the title page that gets them there. So don't underestimate the power of a, of a good title page. Now, a couple of things that are gonna be helpful with this is number one, don't just use your notation software's thing. There's nothing wrong with it. It's perfectly fine, but it's just kind of plain. It kind of looks like everything else. And I know for mine, at least with Sibelius, Sibelius doesn't have any type of spell check. It doesn't really have a lot of options for what you can do with the title page. And so you're better off just using a different program. I use Canva to make my title pages. I mean, they're nothing special. It just makes them stick out a little bit more. Don't underestimate the power of a, a good title page. Another thing that you really want to be conscious of besides the title page is the info page. This is something that is very easy to miss, but you need an info page. It needs to be clear to the person who doesn't know the work, who hasn't learned it yet, as they turn over past the title page to see what is the instrumentation? What's the duration? Are there any specific notes to the performers? Do they have to do something strange and measure 173? And you need to be a little more clear than what you can realistically do in the score. If you're using alternate notation, you know, you need your icon key there. You need to say, hey, this symbol means this thing. It's, it's a very important thing that you need to have. In addition to that, you need to have your program notes. It's always good to just have that so that the conductor or the music director or whomever can get a sense of what is this piece about? Is this going to fit my needs for my concert series that I'm running. I also recommend putting your bio on it and you never know what that can do. Just make sure you put everything that they need on there. It's really important. It usually doesn't need to be more than a single page. I don't recommend using your notation software for this either. It's kind of the same sort of situation. There's no spell check. There's not a lot of formatting options. I usually just use whatever document 
series is on my computer, so I use Pages for Apple, but you could use Google. It doesn't matter. As long as you use something that has a little bit more options for you to make it clear, you can always add it into the, uh, into the PDF later on. At the top left corner of your score, you need to indicate if it's going to be a score in C or transposed. This is essential piece of information that you have to have in an orchestral score and a wind ensemble score and any kind of chamber thing that's using transposing instruments. It's less important to a certain degree in choral music just because nine times out of ten if it's just for SATB, well then there's no transposing instruments. You usually use that spot to tell what the lyricist is. But if you are, let's say you wrote a piece for you know B flat clarinet and uh, and choir, then you need to acknowledge, well, is the clarinet part, is it in C or is it in B flat in the score? They need to know. There's nothing worse than getting a score where you're like, I don't, I don't know what chord this is. I have, no, I have no way of knowing, especially if you're not using, let's say you're writing a piece that's not using a key signature, which is pretty common. <laughs> what chord is this? What notes are going on? And you don't want to put your conductor in that situation where they don't know. It's absolutely essential. Put it in your score. After you've got that, the next most important thing is making sure that you are accurately portraying score order. I'm not gonna get into all of the specifics of that. You can look it up. There's plenty of resources online, but you wanna make sure that you're accurately following it. In wind ensemble and in orchestra, you really kinda of wanna follow score order to the T. There is some leeway with this when it comes to chamber music. In chamber music, when you have weird, interesting combinations of instruments, it doesn't always make sense to follow score order. For instance, if I had a trio for flute, violin, and tuba, score order is going to be flute, tuba, violin. It would make a lot more sense to have it be either flute, violin, tuba, or violin, flute, tuba, whichever. And in that particular case, I think that's okay. There is some leeway there. But for large ensemble scores, you wanna make sure that you're really putting it in the correct order. The other missed opportunity I see in finished scores is really thinking about your tempo and what you say at them. It's very easy to just put quarter equals 120 and that's it. And there's nothing wrong with that, but you, you're missing an opportunity to give your players an extra sense of what is the character or the mood that you're trying to create there. It can be really helpful. Even just a simple word can give a player direction. It can really change how they play. Let's say we have a slow tempo, quarter equals 50. Okay, so it's a relatively slow tempo. If you put mournful, as the character. That's very different than the exact same music being written with menacing. Again, the tempo doesn't change. The the notes don't change. The rhythms don't change. But the, the intention behind it would change. And that's a really important thing. So don't miss out on that. Remember, it's about creating clarity for your players and for your performers. We think a lot in the creating of music as being similar to like being like a chef, like you're, you're making this an ingredient, you're working with this, and you're mixing it together, and you're adding the sauce and whatever, you're building the thing, and, and it, you're, you're concerned about how the texture works and the taste and all these great things that make it similar to being a chef. And that part of the process is. But the score is the recipe book. And you want your instructions for cooking to be crystal clear so that you don't need to be there to make it happen. You have to make the score something that someone who doesn't know the piece, like you do, you know the piece, you, you made it, you were intimate with it, you understand things about it, but someone else is gonna see it and have nothing else to look at other than your score. And so it's gotta be crystal clear that you just gotta give them all the information that they need. It's really that important. Have no room for questions. If you leave too much that's vague, people are gonna come up with their own solutions to things, and they may be very different than what you are intending from the works. Also, anytime you have a tempo change within your music, it is always a good idea to mark it with a double bar. It's clarity for the players. Oh, we're entering a new section. Something big is happening here. Even if it is a small change, I think that's important. You don't need to do that for like a cello and, and, and retardando. Another crucial part of this is how you're going to do your time signatures. Again, this seems like a silly thing, but depending on the context, it's gonna be very important. In film world, film world has a completely different approach to time signatures. They like these really huge, gigantic time signatures. And the reason for that is because film people, when they're recording, it's usually, everything is very fast paced in the recording studio and you want it to be as crystal clear as possible. And the conductors don't always have the luxury of being able to study the score 
for for a very long time before it. It's usually hot out the oven, like you know, in a, a week or two in advance, maybe if you're lucky. It's a really fast-paced thing. Now, in orchestra world and in wind ensemble world, it's a little different. Uh, they do like larger size, not as like gigantic as the film world stuff, but they do like it to where it sticks out. You want to be able to look at the page and know, oh, I'm switching into this different time signature. You want that to be obvious. And the best way for large ensemble scores when you're dealing with a lot of instruments is to have them be huge and have them stick out in that way. Now, when it comes to choral and chamber music, there's not so much uh, 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 an importance to this because you're usually in choral music and in chamber music, you're not dealing with a, a large different amount of, of parts at the same time. Generally speaking, chamber music usually doesn't need a conductor, doesn't really want a conductor. The, the score is going to be used by what's called a coach or someone who is sitting and offering feedback, you know, in, in the audience or whatever as they rehearse. But you do want to think about it. At the end of the day, if you're ever confused or you're not quite sure, just ask the person that's going to be conducting it or dealing with it. Hey, what do you want to see? Different people have different preferences, but what I have outlined is generally speaking what I see across the board. Next would be measure numbers. In a score, there is really no reason why you can't have every single measure marked, especially in a large ensemble score. For film, this is absolutely essential. This is a non-negotiable thing. You have to have the measure numbers crystal clear. You have to have every single one because you don't have time. In a recording session, everything is expensive and you don't want your conductor being like, oh, is this measure uh, 152, 153, 54, 55, 56, oh, oh well, this is a uh, uh, measure 156. No, that's like way too much time. They need to be able to look at it. 158, clarinet, you screwed up, let's do it again, here we go. Same thing with orchestra and wind ensemble. It doesn't take that much time or effort to really add it, especially if you put it at the bottom. I usually put it below the bass part. I think that's clear, but different people do different things. Some people like it above the flute part. As long as you have it and it's clear for your conductor, that's important. We're gonna see a difference when it comes to choral music and chamber music when it comes to these. Actually, because you're dealing with text and other things that are on a score that are just different than like regular instrumental music. It might make it a little more cluttered and just having it on every system is totally fine. That's that's a-okay. Same for chamber because again, it's not being conducted again. So it doesn't really need that. Um, I mean, if you want to throw it on, hey, great. It's it, But there's not the same imperative need for a conductor like you would for uh, for any type of large ensemble score. Next up is going to be formatting, which kind of includes several different things. The first thing that we want to think about when it comes to the actual format formatting of the score. What that, what I mean when I say that is the number of measures that are on a page. So this is going to be a slightly different thing depending on the context. Keep on each page about six to eight measures. Again, that's going to depend on the music and if you're having some, you know, kind of odd uh, time signature that you're working with, it might go outside of six or got, might go a little more than eight. It just depends. But generally speaking, I, I found that six to eight is kind of that sweet spot. Uh, and you may you may not always use the auto break. You may find that it might be helpful to have five on this page so that you have a really strong landing on, on a new section for the page break. It, it's just worth thinking about. Now, what's really crucial with this is with coming back to this idea of the conductor score, we don't change the layout. We want the instruments roughly in the same section on each page. It, you know, if you do something where, let's say you hide the staves, that can look really weird and that can put an instrument in a place that we're not expecting it to be as a conductor. And especially if they have limited time with the score to study it, it's just a visual idea of, oh, that instrument isn't where it normally is. It's just a small thing, but generally speaking, you want to keep it. Now, this is not true for like study scores or chamber music or anything like that. Usually you kind of do want to, to, to favor that. For large ensemble scores, you want to keep the format and the layout the same. You want to keep it easy. You're giving them room to write on. I mean, you know, scores are like coloring books for conductors. You want to give them plenty of room so they can do their own stuff. Even if, even if it's just them rewriting the stuff that you already wrote in it. Sometimes that's just how they process things. Don't worry about the number of pages. It's better that it's crystal clear and that they can see it and understand it and identify it than like scrunching it up and, and saving on pages and printing. It's just always better. Okay, so at the end of this are kind of the final checks of what you will do in your score. And this is gonna depend on the different type of score. It might not apply uh, to whichever one you're working on. I always do 
a, uh, for the strings, I always do an arco and a pits check because there's some times where you might forget to put pizzicato uh, on a particular instrument if it wasn't playing earlier. Uh, and then, but there are, are, they are all doing it together and you might not hear it in the MIDI. I've had that happen before where, oh, it didn't make it into the part. So I always do a check through each of the section. I look at the whole string section. Okay, we're all arco here. Okay, when did they switch to pizzicato? Did I make this change here? It's just always worth it. Cause again, if you miss one, the players have, really no way of knowing what you mean. You don't want that to be a question. Some viola player raising their hand in the back, is this pizzicato here? Where are That's gonna eat the whole rehearsal. You don't want that. That sucks. Just be clear, check it. For the woodwinds and for percussion, I make sure I do a check and make sure that everyone has enough time to switch instruments if you're using doublings. So that's just literally, I physically in enact the playing of the flute of like, okay, doo -doo 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 -doo, putting it down. I have to reach for my piccolo. Okay, I'm set and I can play. Did I give them enough time in the music? You know, I mean, you have to give them more time for like English horn or Barry sax or whatever. You wanna be aware of it. You wanna be at least having the intention of, of doing that. Mute check for the brass, really, really important. <laughs> you don't want just, you know, the trombone sections to be st stuck on straight mute the rest of the time because you forgot to write open, you know, or remove mute or whatever you want to call it. When you're doing mixed meter, making it crystal clear in the score what the division of time is. Like, okay, we got seven, eight coming up. Okay, well, you see seven, eight, and that's fine, but seven, eight isn't really so much one type of measure as it is three, right? We've got the dun, 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 dun. That's one type, or dun, 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 dun. You know, that's the second type. And lastly, dun, 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 dun. There are three different ways to approach a seven, eight measure. You're, you need your conductor to know exactly what they're going to do because that's gonna affect their beat pattern. Because otherwise it could cause chaos. People aren't gonna come in correctly because they're looking for the wrong pattern. It's always good to put in the score what the division is if there is an overarching one, like two plus two plus three or whatever. It depends on the situation. But that's really, that's essential. Don't skip that. Every single one needs to have that. You wanna do a check in every single part and it's gonna suck, but you gotta do it for orphaned dynamics. That's when you forget, like you start a dynamic threshold and then you forget like the, the, the hairpins. How loud does this get? I mean, it, you're gonna get different results. If you give this to a clarinet player, yeah, you might get mezzo piano. If you give it to a trombone player, you might get fortissimo. And you're leaving it open to them and, and you, you don't wanna do that. You wanna tell them, hey, this is how much I need. So especially hairpins and things like that, don't skip it. Just make sure every single dynamic makes sense for what they're doing. It's usually best to play through the part individually. Like as you're making the parts, go through it and, and, and sing it and be like, oh, actually, you know what? I forgot to put this here. That's what I recommend. Uh, if you're doing a choral piece, this should already have been fixed, but if you haven't, make sure to do a text check. It can be very easy to have written the wrong, you know, syllable in the wrong part. Uh, or even a misspelling or something simple like you get into the groove and you forget to add an extra letter or whatever the situation is, or making sure that you've broken it off the right way with a melisma. It's just worth checking again. It's those little gray areas. Does this word end on this eighth note or does it start on this eighth note? You just want to be clear. That's, that's the end of the day. After you've done all of those things, make it a PDF. Make it a PDF just like you did in the beginning and look at it differently. If you really have time, print the thing out and then you can literally write on it. That's the best way. It's a little wasteful with paper, so and you might not have time to do that, but you can really see what it looks like and see what you're uh, what you're messing with. You may also consider if you have time giving it to a friend and be like, hey, can you look through this and make sure? Performers are always happy to tell you what's missing. Or if you're working with a conductor and you have a chance to get it to them, they'll find stuff. They'll definitely find stuff. So it's always good. You might not always have time to do that, but if you can, another pair of eyes, they're just gonna see things that you can't see because you know the work and you know what it's supposed to be. Uh, and that's a very valuable thing because at the end of the day, we're making things for people that will make it happen without us in the room. And that is essentially it. I mean, I'm assuming here that, you know, you've already written all of the music, you've orchestrated it appropriately and that you're not, you know, writing things that are impossible for the instrument. Um, and if you follow these things, your score is probably going to be shippable. Again, we're not gonna catch everything. Every score has different things, different dynamics that you're gonna be dealing with. You know, and things like having alternate types of notation that aren't traditional, it's gonna open another can of worms and it's gonna be something different than what I'm gonna cover here. These things all make your score stand out, they make them shippable, and they just make them easier to work with. And at the end of the day, that's the most important thing. Now, to be clear, people are gonna disagree about stuff. I'm sure people watching this 
see a couple things that I have said and disagree with it. And that's great. That's, that's wonderful. You're not going to please everyone. That is impossible. Even if you make it crystal clear and the score is good and you give it to the players and they all play it right, your teacher might be like, I just don't like this thing here. Why did you do this? Why did you put it here? Like there, everyone is going to find something wrong with it. Let go of it. It's okay. As long as they play it and can do it and it comes alive, that's what matters. So don't, don't worry about it. Because at the end of the day, there's really only one thing that matters when it comes to scores. And that is, is it clear? Is it clear? Because if it isn't clear, well then, what are we doing here? <laughs> What's the point, right? It's not really a score. If you have to be there to stand and defend it and help them get through it, well, then you haven't really done your job. Nothing is going to cost you more time money or effort or just energy than a score that is not clear. When people don't know what they need to do, they got to ask questions, they're going to hesitate, they're going to screw up, and it's understandable because you haven't done your job. So as long as you're following the idea of it being clear, because clear is kind, hey, you're going to be okay. That's it. Everyone has a different opinion. Don't worry about it. Do your best and it's going to be great. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. I hope that you found this helpful. Uh, I'm curious. I'd love it if you would leave me a comment. What are some of the things that you do to make your score special? Make it stand out. Make it finish. Make it shippable. I, I'm curious. Did I miss anything in the video? Put it, put it in the comments. I, I sincerely would like to hear it. Okay. Thanks so much. Go make some noise. Cheers.